My name is Sarah Smith Silverman. My pronouns are she and they. I'm a professor of history at American River College, and today's date is November 1st, 2023. So let's start off by establishing the basics. What's your full name? What are your pronouns? And what's your date of birth? My name is Savvy Sky Velasquez. Um, I go by she, they, and also it to people who I trust. Um, what are the other questions? Date of birth. Date of birth. Um, I am of January 4th, 2004. A lot of fours in there. I don't know. <laughs> so you're 19? Yes, I, I am that? 19. Soon to be 20. Um, coming up pretty soon, but yes, I am 19 years old. Um, my birthday is January 3rd. Oh, really? Back to back. To back. So wow. we, know, we know what that experience oh, is like. Oh, that's so cool. Huh. Uh, so tell me about yourself. What are your interests and hobbies? What do you like to do? Um, so I'm in arts new media for my major. A lot of the time what I do in my free time, like, um, I'll be, honestly, I spend a little too much time just hanging out with friends when I could be getting like work done or like doing art. But I, I do love to like paint and, um, how you say, just, just anything artsy, you know, makes me happy. What kind of art do you like? Um, I'm, I'm big into digital art as well, um, like, digital painting is mostly what I'm talking about, um, so, and, and then also, um, I am very interested in 3D art, um, 3D animation, all that. I saw the Spider-Verse movies when I was younger, and then again recently, and I was like, this is gonna be my entire personality now. I can't control it. <laughs> It's hard for me to like things normally. I just, I obsess and I love it. And I know that's pretty close to what I want to do in my future. I I adore it. So, okay. Anything else you want to say about interest hobbies? What do you like to do when you're not in school? Um, let's see. I really like to get out into nature and stuff. I'm sure a lot of people say that. But I, I, I just, for my upcoming speech in one of my classes, it's going to be about burning incense and like spiritual. Let's hold on. I'm, I'm a little into spiritual stuff recently. Let me see if I can find it. I, for good luck for this speech, I, I, bought, a, I brought a little bottle of lapis lazuli. <laughs> to like help calm me and communicate a little bit so just kind of woo woo stuff a little, a little spiritual funness I think it's kind of neat I'm still exploring it but I've always liked naturey stuff as a kiddo and again now um so I I suppose it's an extension there's a mix of you know naturey stuff there that makes me happy I like nature too. Yeah. <laughs> the question is, uh, when do I get it out into nature? Not that often. Oh, <laughs> which is sad. <laughs> no. Okay. Where did you grow up, and where do you live now? I grew up mostly in um, Imperial Valley, El Centro, California, which is um, it's east of San Diego, and it's like a twenty-minute drive from the border. Um, when most people hear that from me, some people will say like, wow, sounds like a lot of action, nothing happened there. Nothing really happened there. It, it's, it was all like, um, compared to Sacramento, where we have, you know, events, big things happening here, it was more stuff you did with your family or your friends' families or connections with people you know kind of thing. Um, and... I, I was mostly raised in that environment, uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, most of the people who lived there, um, including myself, I am half Mexican. Um, most people are Mexican, so um, very cool. Uh, now, uh, as of the past two years now, I live in Citrus Heights, Sacramento County. Yes. What brought you from El Centro to Sacramento? Um, it was for my stepdad's work. He came up here for stuff. Um, I don't know if I'm legally allowed to disclose some of it, but um, they tried to push him out of his job a little bit, and um, now he's up here. 
<laughs> now we're up here. So yeah. Oh, you moved up with your family? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So where do you currently attend college and what do you study? I currently go to American River College and I am studying art new media as well as I'm getting um, some certificates in 3D animation modeling production. Mm -hmm. uh, full time or part time? Full time student. And why did you decide to attend community college? I, ooh, you know what's funny? <laughs> in in high school, I was taking AP classes. I was taking IB classes, international baccalaureate. I thought, I'm so smart, her, using 100% of my brain power. And then I burnt out. Um, and the funnier thing, either way, I I was pretty certain that I would end up going at to a community college anyways, um, just because, um, like, income brackets, it, it would be a whole lot of debt for me to go into, like, a university, so I was trying hard for, a, for, I guess, my own personal learning in the end of it, so in that way as well, it makes sense that I would go to a community college. It's more, I get more opportunities to you know, mess up a little bit when I need to, when I'm growing as an individual. And um, how you say, it's it's also like more experience in practicing my own learning rather than, I have to get these grades up for the university. I'll wait on that for, till later. I'll wait on that later. I, I, <laughs> I'm gonna give myself a break from, you know, high stress, you know, worrying about stuff, which is very funny because it was high school, but yeah, c'est la vie. So you're in your second year? I am in my second year, yes. Although I uh, believe I'll be spending a little extra time at ARC because I'm also pursuing uh, certificates in addition to a um, associates for transfer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So can you talk about how you identify with regard to your social identities, broadly speaking? So all of the above, right? Race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, disabilities, neurodiversity, religion, class, and so on. Mm, okay. Big one. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> something I'm figuring out a little bit uh, very recently, actually. Um, so let's, let's start with sexuality, you know. Um, for a good while, I considered myself lesbian, and I've met some very interesting, magical queer people recently to where, um, I, I can't quite say that's, you know, perfect for, as a label for, you know, what I, um, uh, feel, so, um, now I just say I'm queer. <laughs> it it makes it easier um if cuz queer to me kind of means like you're into people who in one way or another physically or emotionally look the way you do you know what i'm saying um so uh it's it's not super specific i like girls and girls own uh, for me it's a little more broader than that um no shade to the people who you know, they know the they know what they want. They know what they want. For me, I, I kind of don't. <laughs> I'm just kind of gliding through it and seeing like, you guys are cool. You know, <laughs> um, gender. That's a fun one. You know, um, I identify as a demi girl. Um, as I said before, I go by she, they, it. Um, and what can I say about that? Um, it's. It's just kind of, it's, I've always had a thing where, like, as a kiddo, I was like, uh, I guess I fall into the category of a, a tomboy or whatever, and then it, that, it, it wasn't a phase, it just kept going, so, you know, Demi Girl works for me. I also just say non-binary, too, I'm fine with either, um, yeah, let's see, um, race? Uh, ethnicity. I am I am half Irish, half Mexican. Um, I broadly I mostly just identify with white because I mean I I grew up in like 
it was right next to Mexico, so like I I understand like a good bit of the culture. My dad is Mexican. It's just I don't know. For <laughs> for me, I know some of the language. I know some Spanish, and then also um I I just have some lighter skin tones. Um and I was mostly raised by my mother um, through my life, and my mother is white, so I have some context for what it means to be Mexican, but people perceive me as white, mostly, broadly, um, so it just kind of, you know, if that's how, you know, people perceive you, that's kind of going to be how you feel about, you know, your identity, so... I'm not super concerned with it. I suppose I have a lot of privilege in that way. I do. Um, but, hmm. You know, living in either place, I was considered white. So, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, class. Um, my family is how you say. Uh, my family is middle class. I would say. Yes, we live in an apartment. I've never not lived in a in an apartment, but um, we we make a like a, a nice steady income. So, yeah. And then anything about religion, um, disabilities, neurodiversity? You want to talk about right now? Sure. Um, religion. I was raised in a Jehovah's Witness household. Um, my father is still a Jehovah's Witness. He's very Jehovah's Witness, um, and uh, my my mother from uh, a young age she thought this is kind of whack, and my my poor darling mother it took her a long time to you know finally make that leap to make the de the decision and the the action to leave that religion. Um, thankfully for me, um, since I was around. 10 when my my family left it um I'm like I'm like a little silly up here so I didn't retain anything that happened <laughs> in church like I the the most I remember from church is um in the um like the Jehovah's Witness Watchtower magazine that they would hand out there was like pictures of the like the paradise afterlife it's been so long I forget the word they use for it um but there was there was like animals and you know all of this majestic kind of um atmosphere in this illustration and my my mother showed me it and she said because it was uh black and white she said wow it's like a coloring book and I interpreted that as it's a coloring book <laughs> so I colored all of it in um she, uh, she was she was a little a little disappointed but <laughs> um thankfully it, it didn't have too much of an effect on me it had a massive effect on my parents um and it's it's still um you know it's it's something that you come in contact you interact with it and you have to sort of communicate around it while acknowledging it with family members. My mother, as a result of everything she um, in, encountered in that religion as a part of it, um, she has most traumas in relation to that religion, like most of them, um, that you can have as an individual. Um, and she she has PTSD as a result of it. Um, so, of course, of course, the memory is there and you have to acknowledge it. And sometimes you can't really, not that it's a bad thing, but you, um, it's sort of a bad move to discuss anything that's very triggering to that. Um, and I love my mother so much. I I'm glad that um, that I've I've learned a lot about um, m mental illness from her, especially considering that I I got mental illness too. <laughs> so you know it, it helps a lot. Um, 
but uh, yes, we we escaped. I would I would say escaped. I call it a cult. Jehovah's Witness. Ooh yeah. I I had a friend actually down in my in my hometown of El Centro. My my friend he was Jehovah's Witness and oh the poor guy. It was so obvious that he he was a gay man. It was so obvious. Um, but. There was just certain things where we would discuss or interact, and it was clear that he liked boys, he liked men, um, and it was it was just hard to see because with the context I had from earlier in my life, um, this was in early high school at the time, um, it I I didn't know if I could really say anything because I I'm aware that when you're in that social construct that is that church you will be excommunicated from your family if you disobey their their commands of just conforming to to what they expect of you um now he's he's um he's more free with that um, which is which is very great to see, um, but the trauma persists there for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, as for now, I considered myself atheist for a good long time. My um, my current household's mindset is very left-brained, and that's real cool. Like, it's it's just the way to see the world. For you know, if you're if you're looking through that lens like totally it, it works you know but um I have been dabbling dabbling in a little bit of spiritual kind of stuff um I'm currently interested in like Celtic paganism sort of thing um and I'm certainly very beginner just kind of you know getting my feet wet and whatnot but I think it's very interesting and I'm excited to you know, learn more about that. Um, disability. Ooh, fun one. <laughs> okay. Disability. Um, it is a, cr it is a crime that I had not been diagnosed with anything sooner. Um, I, I would get in trouble all the time in kindergarten for just laughing too much and, you know, being talkative and, you know, just, Honestly, being a kid, which some of the teachers were haters, but also I have ADHD, so okay, <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> um, I do have ADHD. I believe it's inattentive. So, um, oh man, I don't know if it's gotten worse recently. Um, <laughs> but because of ADHD, you know, of course, it's it's a little harder. It's always been a little hard to pay attention in my classes and get homework done is the big thing. Um, through high school and middle school, I would be up so late trying to get homework done because I couldn't get my brain to focus on it. It just wasn't quite working. Um, focus, focus is definitely, you know, a big issue. Um, let me see, what else can I say? I also have uh, bipolar disorder. Um, I believe type two, where it's, um, uh, I forget the word. Ah, it's, I, I don't have very large manic episodes. I, I have in the, f before, but also I think it's because I was on ADHD medication, which is stimulants, which can cause that, um, oh man, people, people hate when I, when I say that I have bipolar disorder and they judge me and like I <sighs> I don't I don't know what it would really take for someone to not interpret bipolar disorder as something crazy about a person I am medicated I have been medicated for a long time um I, I suppose I could reflect on it more. I was diagnosed when I was, how you say, 17. Um, and... Ooh. 
<laughs> bipolar disorder, when when you don't know you have it and you're experiencing these large episodes, depression and mania or hypomania, um, it's it's a little. I get that it's. I I definitely see that it's unsettling, not only for the people around you, but for you as well, <laughs> because. Some, sometimes you'll, you know, you'll have a, a second to just ponder, like, what's kind of been going on recently because you don't know what it is at that stage if you're not diagnosed or anything. Um, and if, if you don't really know what's happening, then it can be scary once you take the time to think about it. Like, I didn't used to you know, go from this extreme to this extreme, I, for, this is a little embarrassing, I'm not going to say that one, <laughs> but, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of people hear the word bipolar disorder, um, and they, they might, like, take a step back, or they'll just, you know, not react or anything and I don't know I, I often don't mention it to people I'm a little afraid of mentioning it to people sometimes because I, I genuinely I do put in a lot of effort in trying to maintain you know a, a relatively stable mood Despite having a mood disorder, I remain medicated, I attend therapy and whatnot. Um, but the words themselves, people don't usually take kindly to that. Um, I suppose that's what I can say about that. I think a lot of people just don't have, I mean, I think they have bias, right? Mm -hmm. um, in part, that bias is there because there's very little education and awareness around different mm -hmm. uh, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah. people are reacting in a way that's problematic mm -hmm. and it's rooted in the sort of real lack of education and awareness. Too. Yeah. A lot of mental health awareness is kind of around... Um, at least this is what I notice. A lot of mental health awareness is um, s sort of revolving around awareness of depression, awareness of autism or ADHD. All very good. We should all know more about that. But once you once you get into the ones that are just discussed less, then people will, even if they, you know claim to be you know more interested in like yes mental health awareness they they'll still kind of like s sneer or not understand or not be sort of educated on bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or personality disorders they still might end up that crowd thinking oh that person's kind of crazy that person has mental health issues i mean which side are you on? You know, people deserve dignity and respect and love, even if, you know, they're a little different. That's okay. Give them a hug or something. Or maybe don't give a hug. If they don't want a hug, don't give them a hug. But, you know, give them a smile. That's all. <laughs> um, I think that's well said. So <laughs> I have follow-up questions about everything you've said so far. Oh, awesome. But, cool. Um, let me start. Going back a few minutes, so you said that... I also might have autism, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Have you recently been thinking about that? Um, yes. <laughs> in the past... Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep this brief. Okay. No, in, no. In no the... You don't have to keep it brief. <laughs> okay. In the, in the past um, month, I've had 10 plus magnificent autistic people tell me, you're definitely autistic, or you're autistic, right? Or they, <laughs> or they assume. Um, and I didn't know what to think about that. My my beloved brother is autistic, and growing up, my in in our family, um, 
and in our community, um, autism, like, wasn't a, a thing that was considered real or, like, existed. <laughs> so, um, and since it was more obvious for my brother that, um, he, uh, needed some, uh, extra attention as a kiddo. Um, I was sort of marked as the normal one when clearly I, uh, my, my experiences as a kiddo were, you know, they were, they were not holistic. <laughs> um, there, there's some people who assume that I, um, am not autistic as well. Um, and I, I reckon that I mask decently well. Um, I was bullied really bad in like in elementary, so I, I had to teach myself how to read facial expressions because it was not intuitive. Um, and uh, I, I, I mask decently well now. I reckon, um, even though I look a little funny, um, I, I try to, you know be very maybe overly aware of social cues and whatnot. It gives me a little anxiety because I spend so much, you know, mental effort paying attention to it um, when interacting. Um, but um, it was not until like this past month that I had a lot of people saying, oh, you're definitely autistic. Um, and I, I just look through the symptoms thinking about my memories when I was a kiddo um before I had a whole lot of rejection trauma um and I I realized oh oh no oh I I walk into the GSA at ARC um I talk to uh the the wonderful folks there I I waltz in saying I really need to be affirmed right now. I, I really need to talk. I, I need you guys to hear me out on something. I say, da 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 da. I wrote this list where it says, um, I, I'm, I have these symptoms and not these, but maybe these. Um, I explain all of this. <laughs> and then people are, you know, just kind of looking over as I'm saying this and they're like, oh, we just kind of assumed. <laughs> All, ev mind you, everyone in that room was also diagnosed with autism. So, woo, I, on, on a, um, a diagnostic sort of, uh, examination that there is online, um, that real psychologists, uh, psychiatrists, um, consider when diagnosing patients with autism, um, there's, there's a, a range between 90 that's um, you have indications of autism pretty strong but you may not be autistic and then there's that was 90 and then there's 130 where it's most autistic people get this score on this RADS examination it's called I got 101 baby so it's yeah there are there are no holistic people in my family I, I think <laughs> so uh, we we probably should have figured that one out sooner, but you said that you use the term demi girl and also the term non binary uh, with re reference to your gender identity. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what those mean to you? Sure, personally. Personally, okay. So not like explaining like a uh, demi girl falls under the non binary category, or would that be suffice? I think whatever occurs to you, basically, okay. yeah, but if you can make it, if it's possible to make it a little bit personal rather than just give the definition only, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, okay. Demi girl, demi girl, demi girl. Um, hmm. Um, what can I say? <clears throat> I am assigned female at birth. Um, so I was raised with, you know, Barbies, be this girl, be that girl. Um, and I was kind of fine with it. I mean, I remember when my mama got me a whole bunch of Barbies as a kiddo, um, for Christmas, even though we weren't supposed to have Christmas because Jehovah's Witness, um, 
Uh, I only really liked having the Barbies when I had a, a friend around, um, a female friend. <laughs> Um, because we, we would get to play, and that would be interesting, but playing with Barbies on my own, I mean, okay, it's, it's girls. Mm. I, I was more interested in, like, my, my friends, or my, my brother's, um, like, dinosaur book, or, like, our, our, our book all about cats, or something like that. Um, which is, I reckon, a little more neutral than Barbie, um. So, um, I, I definitely appreciate, um, feminine things. I, I like a nice perfume. I like, um, you know, being a tad colorful, which shouldn't really have a gender per se, but if we're going to assign gender to certain attributes, then, I mean, I do, I do like stuff like this. I, I do kind of appreciate dresses. I like flowing things. I like long skirts. Um, um, albeit, I, I like feminine things that are a little bit more androgynous, which is, I reckon, a decent descriptor of what it means to be a demigirl to me. Um, a little more non-binary than simply, you know, let's get a skirt, let's get some heels or whatever which isn't all what it means to be a girl um certainly um eh, maybe i'm taking gender cues too seriously <laughs> might be the autism <laughs> i don't know um what can i say um i'm i i like a little bit of androgynousness i'm pretty androgynous in the way that i present myself. Oh, here, here's a good one. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not gonna take my hair off because it's a little bit of a mess right now, but it is, it is cut pretty short. Um, I, I buzzed it a little while back just because I was like, I need to know what it feels like to be bald right now. It was an impulse that was just sitting in here for months, like half a year. I was like, I want to be bald so bad. So I, I buzzed it relatively short. And I was like, this is pretty cool. But then uh, another wave came where I'm like, well, what if I want slightly longer hair again? So it's a, it's a little bit of a, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's a fun game where I get to be um, a little bit more androgynous sometimes, a little bit more feminine sometimes. Either way, I, I fall along that spectrum right there. Um, and it's it's funny that I'm sort of a girl who will go up to you and be like, dap me up. What's up? How you doing? <laughs> How's it been today, dog? What's going on? <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of fun. <laughs> and then you said you use she, they, it as your pronouns, but you don't always share it as your pronoun. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, why do you use all those pronouns? And um, I guess under what circumstances do you share your pronouns? Sure. Um, to most people that I meet, um, there, there's kind of a few reactions I'll have. Um, if I interact with someone and I know that they're probably not super receptive to um, pronouns as a concept, <laughs> then I'll just allow them to assume I go by she, her. Um, you mean like the people who say, my pronouns are USA, <laughs> USA. <laughs> Like, you was you was <laughs> anyway. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> My pronouns are hee haw. Yeah, if they don't like pronouns as a co concept, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll just let them assume I go by she her. Yeah. Um, if I interact with someone who's you know, uh, probably a little more liberal, I'll be like, yeah, I'm she they. Um, I go by that. Um, and again, I'll typically just go by that's she. And I'm fine with that, you know. I don't particularly have any preference with any of the pronouns. I'm really fine with whatever. Some of my friends, they interchange, they interchange she or they whether I'm there or not. But in a, in a funny way, if I'm there, they'll say she. And if I'm not, they'll say they. I, I guess my essence is they, them. I, I don't know. 
kind of funny. But um, yes, I, I go by she, they to other folks. And then um, my my magnificent it, it's pronouns. Um, a lot of people aren't into neo pronouns. A lot of people think, you know, they, they just don't get it. Um, when neo pronouns. I, I personally, I, I know other people who go by it, it's um, at least three other people. Um, and it, it's, to me, I, sometimes it's, it's fun to just be on the edges, expanding what it, what gender means. Um, and sometimes I, I, I feel like I embody that a little bit. Um, it, it's. Sometimes when you're sort of on some of the fringes of society um, due to intersectional factors, as I discussed, um, then sometimes you're going to feel like, well, you're going to question maybe what am I? What am I? And sometimes you don't know anyways. Sometimes you sort of continue to exist as some someone and something that's enigmatic to other people something that no matter what sort of life you live they won't understand you and if they don't understand you then might as well just be you which in my case is sort of an enigma it it's if I have trouble understanding who I am, and frankly, I I do have a pretty good understanding of who I am, what I like, what I enjoy, what I do, what I contribute to other people's lives. I reflect a lot. I spend a lot, frankly too much time, thinking about how I interact and how I exist around other people and and how I feel about myself. Out of time. But regardless, and as a result of thinking so much about what I am, who I'm supposed to be, um, I've I've sort of come to a place where it it's is fine. I like it. It it's I get to be my own thing. People will judge what it it's means as pronouns onto that person, what they think that person is supposed to be. That's sort of the root of it all in the first place. It it's. How did you discover the possibility of using it it's? The possibility. Um, hmm. I was researching neo pronouns as a concept because um, Prior to um, really exploring what gender means to me, I was a little confused by them too. I didn't really get neo pronouns. I, I was like, okay, she, they, he, that's fine. Fay, um, pup self, it, it's, it, it's. Why would you want to be called it? And then something just, boom. <laughs> I don't know. I... I started thinking about myself a little more and, you know, as I said, I do that a lot. Um, and, you know, I came to that realization after researching kind of this is a thing and people use it. Yes. Um, I, I felt a little safer knowing that other people feel the way that I do about gender in that way, even if it's a way that's um, rather uncharacteristic to a lot of people um but i enjoy it so if it makes me happy at the end of the day it's none of your business <laughs> that's the, probably the most important point right yeah but, yeah um, do you think it, it's it's because usually you know non and you know non-animal life non-human life we use the word in english we use it right to refer mm -hmm. to to non-living things to objects and non-living things um don't have gender they aren't mm -hmm. 
gender norms aren't imposed on non-living things. Do you think that's sort of, I'm just sort of thinking through it. I'm learning myself, actually. I think there might be a little bit You're of a welcome. generational divide. I'm a little older. <laughs> so I have a lot to learn, but I was just thinking about that, the ways in which um, we don't use gendered language to refer to non-living things. And there's yes. a sort of a certain freedom there. Yes, it is. Um, a lot more of a uh, genderless term than other potential ones, which is kind of just she and he. But it's it's more genderless, which is pretty cool. I like it. So, um, let's see, my next question. Oh, would you mind talking some about your coming out process? And I know, I think <laughs> it sense from what you said earlier, it's still happening, but what's your coming out yeah. uh, process been like? Mm -hmm. Figuring out your identities and coming out to people that you're close to, family and friends. Mm -hmm. Let's see, coming out. I knew that I liked girls when I was eight years old. <clears throat> My mm, wonderful friend at the time, she randomly asked me one day, we were playing outside, and she said, when you get older, would you rather marry a boy or a girl? And I said, mm, a boy, but only because they make more money. Well, <laughs> that sure said something about me, didn't it? Huh. <laughs> um, in essence, I do really love girls. I, I, shout out to women. <laughs> um, so I knew from a very young age, little eight-year-old me as a kiddo, knew that I had same-sex attraction in one way or another. Um, and um, I, I just kind of, I had that one conversation, um, but then after that I sort of forgot or repressed it a little bit. Um, and when you're a kiddo, it doesn't come up all the time. Um, and regardless, you're going to have, you know, um, compulsory heterosexuality kind of expected onto you anyway. So, um, for, uh, when I was in middle school, um, I, I had all these feelings like, I like girls. <laughs> I like girls. Um, but I... In, in my household at the time, I was living with my father, and I had a uh, couple stepsisters at the time. Um, and my my one of my stepsisters at the time, she would um, joke like, ooh, Savvy's bi, ooh. And I would be like, no. Um, cut to a year later, um, when I'm living with my, my mother and my stepdad, um, <laughs> uh, we we just got back from Comic Con, and there were some pretty girls there. <laughs> and um, on the way back, I'm I'm I don't know what brought me to it. I guess it was just kind of breaking a breaking point where it it was hard to ignore, and it just kept coming up, and I I felt a little bit more freedom in it. Um, there was, there was more examples in, of, um, homosexuality in media. I was a big fan of Steven Universe as a kiddo, um, and that had the first example of, um, a lesbian wedding, or a gay wedding in, um, animated media. And because of that, I was like, liking girls is a real thing. <laughs> um... So eventually, um, I'm I'm in the car with family, and I'm I'm telling them I have something to say. I have something to say. I'm bi, and my family was super accepting. Like my my mom was totally cool with it. Very nice, you know. My my stepdad, they were like, oh yay, cool. Um, my my uh, family that I live with currently, um, this family, my mother and my stepdad and my brother, um, all pretty accepting. So very nice. Um, and, um, so I identified as bi for a while, then I identified as pan because I realized, oh, non-binary people exist, and I didn't quite, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a thing, but, um, there's, so there's some 
differences in the meaning but um, of each thing. But um, I, I identified as pan and I was having fun with that for a while. Um, and I, I was dating some guys. Um, this, this is high school now, uh, early high school. And, you know, it was fine. Um, <laughs> like, it's, it's fun, um, and whatnot. Um, and then quarantine rolls around and the, the, uh, I like girls, the I like girl, it came back. <laughs> now that I, I was surrounded by less people and less compulsory heterosexuality around me, especially um, since I lived um, in El Centro, California, a lot of people, they would look at you a little sideways if you were um, not straight or cis or what have you. Um, so um, I, since, since I was sort of just on my own to think for a good long while, um, the the realization sort of came to me where it's like, I don't know if I really like guys or if I just like attention that I receive from them. And it sort of feels like instead of naturally sort of, you know, um, having a relationship, you know, happen, it's, it's more like, I picked that one. I'm gonna <laughs> date you now, <laughs> which um, it was. It was a little funny, but it was there. Were, there were some definitely some sweet moments, and I, I I reckon that I I still do have a certain part in my heart that you know the dudes are they're nice, you know. <laughs> um. Uh, but um, how you say? So for a little while, I identified as lesbian, and then I went back to identifying as pan because I wasn't sure. Now I identified as lesbian for a little while again, and then now I just say I'm queer because with the um, the intermixing of being non-binary and not totally sure of my um, attraction, um, it's just easier to say queer. Um, I, I could also, I suppose I could say sapphic, um, I am into feminine people, but again, um, trans dudes are pretty cool. I like, I like trans dudes, they're, they're cool, <laughs> I like them, um, so I just say queer now. Um, one more thing about coming out, um, I it was earlier this year actually I in in my 19 years of living I hadn't you know in informed my biological father that hey dad I, I like girls <laughs> um so I I visited my my father in Colorado and oh there this this is more about religion I reckon, but um it was just kinda hard to talk to him. He was he was so involved with the religion and n not being worldly, as they would say, that there there just wasn't much left to discuss with him. In addiction in addition to addiction problems, um, that that persists even though I you know, he sort of led me to believe that that wasn't a problem anymore. Um, that was still present, and it was, it was just so much to take in. Um, my, my father had apparent delusions, and, you know, it, it just wasn't a good atmosphere. Um, I had visited him for one day in Colorado, and I, I came to him the next morning crying. I, I said, I can't do this. Um, and in, in that atmosphere, when you're talking about church and religion and all that, it's inevitably going to come up that you need to be my girl. You need to be a straight woman 
for the church, for God. Um, and that, in addition to a lot of other things, it, it's, it just, eventually it just imploded. I, think I needed to go home. Um, and when I, when I got home to Sacramento here, um, I, I texted him. I, I didn't want to pr push against the religion too much. He's 50 now, and if, if he's still very involved in the religion, it's not in my hands. Um, so I, I... If I was going to reveal anything about the way that I was uncomfortable there, it would be one thing, which I decided if I'm going to, because when I, when I was trying to leave, um, the situation saying, please, I, I need to book a flight back home. If, if you can't pay for it, I will. Um, um, I, I just couldn't get out an explanation for the way I was feeling because so much of it involved the religion. Um, so when I did get home, I decided I'm, I feel bad not explaining anything. I'm just going to tell him part of the reason I was so upset is because I'm gay. And he didn't really respond for a, a, a while. Um, eventually he, he texted back and he said, I love you. You're my daughter, which... It's sweet, but I I don't have a whole lot in common with my my father now, which is it's tough. Um, I'm lucky that I have a, a very um, kind and loving household currently, but um, it it sort of reflects on why I had you know not been open about my feelings for so many years as well. Um, growing up in a community that was not receptive to, um, queerness, um, so, sorry that got a little dark. <laughs> I was gonna ask a follow-up question about yes. your relationship with your biological father, mm -hmm. so the fact that he's so enmeshed in the church, um, I mean, for your, I don't want to talk too, too long about this stuff, but I'm sort of curious for some of the background maybe to ex be explained. Did your, when your mom got out of the church, did that also result in divorce or was that kind of separate? It was divorce. Yes. Okay. The same two birds with one horrific stone. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, and then did you kind of maintain a relationship with him after that? Um, I did. My... My parents were a little upset that I was still trying to be on good terms with both of them. Oh. Um, so, eh, me. Um, and things were pretty good until I moved in with my mother uh, in eighth grade. Um, after that, my my father, when I asked him, he didn't really reveal much. There, There was some confusing conflicting information I, I I don't know if I need to go in a whole lot of detail here but um, uh, it he he mentioned that he had some some sort of major breakdowns like in public and I he he didn't elaborate and I I just was kind of left wondering you know um, this is a little tangent, but it, it reminds me of this. Um, my, ooh, sorry, my um, my mother doesn't really like that I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She sort of denied it for a, a while, um, or at least she doesn't like that. You know, yes, there is truth to it. Yes, I have shown every single symptom. Um, uh, in accordance with the DSM-5 for the diagnoses on that. Um, and how do you say? The first time, this was before that, that one time where I really needed to go home when I visited my dad. I had visited him before that, um, a year before. And I, um, I asked him a whole lot of questions. We were having some fun. 
talking about um, our heritage, you know, because I hadn't actually gotten to know a whole lot of my, my dad's side of the family. I, I know, like, some of our, like, aunts, or our tios, and our, you know, our primos and stuff, but, like, I, I don't know a whole lot, so I, I decided I'm gonna ask a whole lot right now, and we had fun. Um, one of the real interesting things I learned is that my father's father used to talk to saints. Sure explain something, doesn't it? <laughs> Interestingly, my, um, my father never told my mom that when they got together. So, um, several years later, cut to the future, um, Kid, kiddo's having some, some delusions. Where did that come from? No. <laughs> yeah, I, I think after I told that specific piece of my, that, that specific piece of information to my mama, she, she understood like, oh no, yes, this is a genetic thing. Yes, my, my daughter has bipolar disorder, so. We left off um, talking about race and ethnicity. So, can you talk some about your your relationship to your Mexican side and your racial identity? Sure. Um, let's see. Um, my last name is Velasquez, um, and I asked my father in that moment, um, "What can you tell me about our last name?" Um, and Velasquez is pretty Spanish, um, pretty Spanish, um, um, the name, as far as he said, was believed to derive from the Basque people of Spain, Spain, because Basque, Velasquez, Velasquez, um, which, pretty cool, um, but, um, as well, my father actually got a DNA test. I suppose this is a little bit more about my father. I'll continue later. But um, my father is 50% native, 50% broadly white, though most, mostly Spanish. So um, pretty down the middle right there. Um, however, culturally, um, despite growing up in El Centro, like, you know, right there, um, it's... El Centro still is a pretty whitewashed town. I haven't visited Mexico. I haven't gone there and really experienced the culture. My dad and my mom have visited there. They've gone to Cancun, which it's, again, kind of, you know. But it's they've still been immersed in Mexico. I have not. Um, I've, when, when I say I'm f from the border, I mean... Yes, I'm from that city at the border. I'm not from it or have experience in any part of Mexico. I don't have that. Um, although I am very interested in learning about, you know, the Mexican culture, like uh, Dia de los Muertos or like, you know, um, learning about the ancient city of Tenochtitlan, if I pronounce that right. Um, uh, just, just history very cool um i like learning about the culture you know um very cool that being said even if i learn a good deal about it and even if i know some of the language um i'm i'm still not gonna you know really know uh what it means to be immersed to be mexican i'm half mexican which mm, it's and especially being mostly raised by my white mother um being considered one of the white girls which there weren't very many um uh in in my hometown um and even my dad um he uh the way he presents himself at least now like he he acts a little like he tries to be whitewashed it, that up in Colorado, he's saying howdy to people and making it like a point to say howdy. Okay, okay, Is that, okay. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I I don't have as um, 
culturally in touch of an experience as I could. So mostly I, I'm just kind of, I resort to saying white or half white. Mm. It's funny also kind of being more light skinned and being half white, half Mexican and growing up in El Centro, maybe your experiences are distinct because it was so, there were so many people who were Mexican and maybe they were darker skinned. So being like, called the white girl really shaped your experience and yeah. then if you had grown up in a whiter place maybe your experience would have been your consciousness or awareness would have been shaped much in a different way I wonder probably yeah mm -hmm. having your last name right and having mm -hmm. be, being half Mexican people yeah. mispronouncing the name up here yeah <laughs> well <laughs> so um okay Anything else you want to say about being biracial, being half Mexican, half white, as it sort of influences how you think about yourself in the world? Hmm. How you relate politically, and there's a lot of anti-Mexican rhetoric and oh, stuff, yeah. you know, and how does that influence you? Yeah. Um, oh, man. A lot of the rhetoric, like what some people say whether they realize it or not like they're talking they'll like discuss the border and they'll say like um how you say they'll say like we don't know the people coming in they could be they could be rapists they could be murderers they could be da 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 most people just want a better life for their families you know some parents say I would kill to have, you know, my my family to have a good life. You don't think some people would cross a border without the proper visa to have their family have a better life, you know? Um and what else can I say? And growing up in a border town, too, that must have influenced you, even if you were, because you were more light-skinned, you were seen in this way, right? Yeah. And kind of, there is a kind of a difference between, like, growing up in a border town and growing up, yeah. you know, far away from the border. Mm. Anyway, maybe I interrupted you. Sorry. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, the question was, like, reflecting on, oh, what people say about the border? Or I guess just, you know, anything else in general you want to say about your kind of identity as biracial, your uh, kind of relationship to what it means to be half Mexican, and this, especially in the political context, mm. giving you space to say anything else you feel like saying right now? Political context. Um, a lot of people are just sort of uneducated or they're reading very biased resources on you know, the experience of my hometown or it, it definitely depends on which segment of the border we're talking about. It's it's not one state that has the border. Um, it's it's all several, you know, from from California to Texas. It's it's, you know, pretty big swath of land over there um, through that area. And you know, for example, in Yuma, which was not too far from my hometown, it's like like a good few miles away, um, Yuma, Arizona, um, there there does tend to be more problems there as I've as far as I know. Um, um which it's it's a variety of things, but at least in, in my hometown, um the border was fucking boring. <laughs> It was just waiting for three hours to get home for, for most people. Um, I I knew some people who they they had some uh, property that they owned in the United States. So they would cross the border every day to get to uh, our high school there. Um, and most of the stories I hear from that, it's it's just kind of like nothing happened today yet again. Like, and, and it's not like I was asking like all the time. I, it's just... Um, most of it, if I ever did, like, oh, hey, how is the ride here? Boring. <laughs> Took longer today, you know. <laughs> uh, so, it, at least in my, at least in my knowledge of that, most of the border, it's nothing too, you know, crazy. It's not, 
Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about more about disability and mental health issues. So how do you think, you know, having ADHD, BPD, potentially autism, how has that affected your education, how you've done in your classes? Um, hmm. This is kind of an interesting one, I reckon, as I've been reflecting on it more. Um, I'll, I'll start with autism, I suppose, because that one is, you know, more longer stretching since it is a developmental one. Um, I had hyperfixations um, on, get this, getting good grades. <laughs> um, so much so that I would just kind of um, not pay as much attention to other parts of my life as I should have, like um, just taking care of myself and sleeping appropriately. Uh, so, I mean, I, I got a good 4.0 through high school, but shoot, <laughs> I didn't have fun doing it for a whole lot of it. Um, but, and then I, I also developed, oh, this is terrible. My, um, my, freshman year brain of high school I was like <laughs> I, I, I found this new thing called the Joe Rogan experience and and my brain was like oh my gosh he's spitting facts he said <laughs> he's telling me how to improve my life guys Jordan Peterson says all I need to do is clean my room so I kind of developed a hyper fixation on um just improving life, which is good. But well, goddamn, if I don't hate Joe Rogan, <laughs> I don't know. That <laughs> it's funny now. But shoot, no, Joe Rogan and stuff like that is straight up just propaganda. Whack, whack. Not into it. White, right, and white wing rhetoric. Mm. Bleh. Like the, uh -uh. the language you think you just did white and right. <laughs> it's true, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I I reckon that um, part of the reason why I might have been seen as more ish neurotypical in my hometown is because I had hyperfixations on like you know developing myself and getting good grades, which um. Even though my obsession with them was definitely abnormal, <laughs> um, it 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 seemed like something that it like a more of a normal interest um, compared to like my interest in Hatsune Miku, <laughs> uh, for example. So um, there's you know there's that's just kind of how I brought myself through that. That was just a major interest of mine. Um, let me see, through school, ADHD, ooh, um, I, I, uh, said this a little bit earlier, but, um, I spent way too much time, you know, procrastinating because of ADHD on my assignments, um, I would spend a lot of time, like, just on YouTube or Instagram, I needed to get rid of all of my social media just to, for a chance this year, just for a chance of, not procrastinating and it's it's been okay but um you've been off of social media yeah yeah oh, yeah. yeah wow good job um it took me a while to just finally be like i don't i can't i can't keep doing this i i took longer and longer breaks until eventually i was like i don't really need to spend my time doing this it gives me anxiety anyway with how fast paced all of this is it's like Eventually, I was like, I, I don't, I just, mm, the, I, I still spend like, um, a, a decent amount of time just like on YouTube doing whatever, you know, watching some fun stuff. But it's, it's not like how it was. Oh, oh, speak of the devil, ADHD. I, I would spend so much time, especially during quarantine, just all day on TikTok or whatever, Instagram, um, just wasting days, weeks, what was I doing, what was I doing, also I was depressed because bipolar disorder, oof, 
talk about factors just interacting real bad. Um, I learned while researching autism. Sorry, I'm jumping around if this is... Oh, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Speak of ADHD now. Um, but I was, I was researching a lot about autism, uh, recently, and, um, uh, I've learned that as it is a spectrum, it often has co comorbidities in other things. Um, those things include ADHD, which is often com comorbid with bipolar disorder, um, I, and I also may have dyslexia, which I, I brought up to my psychiatrist, and he referred me to something else. So, uh, <laughs> I've got I've got a lot of funky stuff up here, but you know, I'm I'm vibing. Do you think you need, or maybe even if you don't feel like you really need need, but are there any accommodations that uh, professors can provide to you that might be helpful? You know, to keep you kind of invested in the class, interested, to help you do well. Um, let me see. In exams, I am allotted extra time thanks to DSPS. Very nice. Um, let's see. Um, as for the teachers themselves, what can they do to, you know, um, it helps me a lot when, um, Teachers explain something big, and then they put it into simple words. That's kind of a simpler one that you can do, um, but it it, help, it saves me a lot of time, and it, it helps me understand a lot better. Um, um, as well as, you know, using visuals is a is a very good one uh, for me. Um, what else? Um, The use of color is good in whether it be just online or whatever. Um, mostly online, I reckon, to save ink, maybe. But um, color is very nice. Um, <laughs> this may be a little unrelated, or maybe it's very related. Who knows? How do you think being neurodivergent influences... Oh, wait. Did you want to say anything else before yeah. I ask that question? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. So how do you think being neurodivergent influences your queerness? And maybe how does, maybe you could think about, if it's possible to think about the other way, how does being queer um, impact your experience as somebody who's neurodivergent? How does being queer affect, and how does being neurodivergent? Hmm. Something that's been on my mind recently is, this is another moment of me questioning uh, identity. Yet again. Um, so, something I noticed, this is so funny, okay. I had yet another hyperfixation um, for a, a good while on dating people and being interested in romance. Um, and after, you know, I, I just kind of, you know, fell out of interest in that. Um, uh, not for any specific reason or another, I just, um, as I'm trying to be m more mindful and, like, stable and, you know, my, my practices as an individual, um, that, that, you know, interest of mine just sort of, meh, flew away with the wind. <laughs> um, and as a result of that, I, I now don't really have much of a concept of, you know, feeling attracted, like, um, or being interested in romance is the thing. So I, I think this might be, I, I noticed this before I realized that I, I may be, um, autistic. Um, I noticed that I had, like, um, I just, I, even if other people were, like, expressing, like, interest in me, I was just like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed about it, but I, I, I just feel a little more less interested, a little less connected to, um, you know, what it means to f experience romance recently. Um, and it was the same way before I had that hyperfixation of mine about, you know, 
dating people. Um, I, I, if, if people brought it up to me, like, you know, they have an interest or whatever, I would just kind of be like, okay, maybe, <laughs> whatever. Like, I, I didn't really feel the romance. When I, when I did have that, um, interest, I, you know, the, I did feel romance and it was real, but now I don't know if it's just other factors or other things in my life. Um, me but I the the act and the emotion and the experience of romance it's just something that I don't really connect with right now um so I, I I've been thinking maybe I'm a romantic which is another fun one but I'll see if I get interested in romance again I don't know kind of funny do you think being autistic has anything to do with how you perceive your gender and how you feel your gender? That's a good one, yeah. I reckon part of the reason that I I feel more androgynous, part of the reason why I feel comfortable and, you know, just very, very cool about it, its pronouns and that usage um, is because I feel, well... As as an as a probably most likely autistic individual, um, I I don't I have a harder time just sort of falling in line with other you know expectations in life um, because it's I take them a, a little maybe too literally where um, gender is this well uh what if what if i feel a little different um i don't know <laughs> um hmm. eh. makes it's me hard, feel it's like hard to figure out how to explain it right but there is yeah. more people who are um gender non-conforming right non-binary trans among the autistic community let's go <laughs> i've been new <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I do want to ask you about, yes. we could probably talk about that more, but, and I am interested in asking you several more questions, but I'm just looking at the time, so I want to mm -hmm. just make sure we talk about class for a minute before I ask you more education questions. So why do you say that you are middle class? What does that mean? Um, currently, my, my stepfather is a lawyer. He works for the state, and... Um, he, it's, it's this specific field involving tech and whatnot. Oh, I don't know if I'm supposed to say that, uh, because it is legal. Like, well, you could always take it out later. So okay. Okay. Make, remember. Uh, when. <laughs> <sighs> okay. My father is an attorney. Um, so there, there is a, a, you know, a good chunk of money there. Um, uh, and I believe with, um, all of the... Uh, income that my family makes, um, it might be around like a hundred k a year. Total. Yes, I believe so. Um, I actually quit my job recently because they were uh, they didn't work. <laughs> um, they were they were very phobic. So. Oh, can you elaborate on that? If you don't, if you feel comfortable. Yeah. Um. Well, where were you working? I was working at a sandwich place that shall not be named, and, um... Now I'm just, I just want to name it, but it's okay. Continue. <laughs> <you? laughs> Don't go to the firehouse subs on Sunrise and Madison, Citrus Heights, okay? Yeah. Well, if they're being phobic, they should be named, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, anyway. um, but it's up to you. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, for my sake, let's not put that out there, but, um... Okay. Uh, hmm, let me... I got too silly. Okay. Um, so I was working in food service and my, this had kind of been from the beginning. At the beginning of me working there, I sort of had a hypomanic, um, to manic episode. I'm, I'm, I still don't really know. Um, but, um, 
I was all this. I've had multiple stages in my life where I have been hyper feminine and like ah, super talkative and like emotions, emotions, emotions. Let's do it. Let's be all happy right now. Ah, um, that's mania for you. Um, and um, how you say? Um, so, in the beginning, people sort of tokenized me as, that's that girl, she has energy, and like, I did, um, but also, I have other energies <laughs> than, um, mental illness, like, in, in, in the mania way, <laughs> um, so, I had gone through therapy, I had, um, gotten a um just more serious about taking my medication for my mood stabilizers um so I became a lot more stable um and they noticeably they started you know noticing that I had changed and instead of treating me like I was a stupid girl they treated me like a nuisance <laughs> you can't win uh, being, being AFAB, I suppose, <laughs> um, but, um, they, I hadn't picked up on this, I'm sure they sort of, I don't know if they ever, like, said anything, but people there knew I was different, and it's probably because I am likely autistic, um, so, they, it, it, it was clear that I didn't, get every social cue there even when I was trying to mask very hard all the time um and I mean I was a good worker my my uh the owner and my manager they admit like I was a pretty good worker um uh I was I always had like a can-do attitude and whatnot or at the very least like I I didn't complain or anything I was just like okay let's do it whatever get this done um but, um, when I came out as lesbian, um, during that time, um, the, uh, the, the general manager was, he, he, like, interpreted it as a, like, sexual thing, when, like, no, I just like girls. <laughs> um, and... It, it was, it was weird, the, I, I had been dead named, I had been, um, that was multiple times, I had been, um, just teased a lot and made fun of, I had, I think all of my, or, like, most of the co-workers that I had worked with on the night crew were, like, also neurodivergent in one way or another but rather than uh these dudes like considering that about themselves they just kind of like hated me mm -hmm. so mm, um in my last couple weeks of working there um when i mustered up the confidence to like submit my two weeks um say hello, I will be submitting my two weeks, you know, um, because the week before, the stress of it had gotten so bad because they just disrespected my presence and seemed to utterly loathe my existence there because I was, a, it was apparent that I was different in one way or another, um, that I had become so stressed by it that um, when I become that anxious and upset, it sort of manifests as me trying to remain calm, but sort of dictating like other things like with other people as well. So I was at home and I was saying, hey, brother, can you do this and this by this time? Hey, stepdad, can you do this and this by this time? Which didn't work up, didn't work out. And, um, uh, we had, like, it was, it was so bad, like, at the end of the day, we had a family meeting, <laughs> and it's, like, what's going on? Like, like, 
Savvy, are you usually, you know, this this doesn't usually happen. Like, why are we stressed? Why did people sort of, you know, um, have such an, I don't know. <laughs> um, but it, at the end of the discussion, it was sort of like, Loki, this is this is my fault. I just, and I started just bawling immediately. And I was crying for like an hour just on that couch. Like, oh my god, this job is stressing me out so bad. So bad. The work itself was fine. The work was fine. It was the people around me who couldn't bear to be around an autistic person or a queer person that made it just so anxiety inducing. It was terrible. Uh, it sounds awful. I'm no, sure it's yeah. to happen. I can imagine you also just had a handful of coworkers there. So uh, why were they like in that very small space, right? Yeah. Uh, treating you so poorly. Um, yeah. In high school, I'm trying to think. I think were you? Did you identify as queer in high school? What was that? Yes, high school. I have. I pansexual, um, right? Yes, I identified okay. as pan. Wow. Very Sorry, cool. I had a moment. Um, Very but good. My tired brain. But um, so, what was it like being queer in your high school in El Centro? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I, I definitely. You know, if you identify as queer, you're usually going to have, like, queer uh, and or neurodivergent friends as well. So, I mean, uh, it was only so different than, like, here. I mean, I, you know, my, my friend group, which I, I did stick, like, pretty close to, was um, queer and neurodivergent, uh, etc. cetera. So, um, but outside of that, when I, when I ventured outside of, um, you know, my, my safe space with my friends and whatnot, um, uh, it, eh, people might just say, like, you need Jesus kind of thing, <laughs> um, or something like that, you know, um, they, sometimes they might not even, like, talk to you if, if they know you're queer in one way or another. Like, they'll just kind of save face by not interacting with you. Um, the the people from my city, at least, that, that happens sometimes. Um, this isn't queer specific, but um, on the day that we were moving um, to Sacramento, my mother was wearing a shirt that says feminists Feminism is for everyone. And this this man said, um, I don't know if this is exactly what he said, but like he, he said like esta baja, like as in that's lower. Like feminism is bad, kind of what he was saying. So femininity in the expression of queerness, like, it wasn't respected for sure. And and um it's 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 definitely something that could be a little developed more a lot developed more um that people are more accepting and understanding that people are queer you know um there was a pride center where i used to live where my mother was um a volunteer for them. I volunteered for them as well, um, here and there. And, um, the, uh, the lady who runs it, uh, Rosa Diaz, um, big shout outs to her. She's pretty cool. Um, but in, right before, uh, my, my family, uh, we moved, there was a, um, a pride, um, uh, how you say, a little pride fair that they had um and it was in October because it was too hot to have it in June <laughs> so um it was this it was this pride fair and it was pretty fun it was pretty cool there was drag queens local drag queens there and you know um some vendors and whatnot very cool um people were so nice down there <laughs> people were giving away prom dresses for free there what? 
the one I got didn't quite fit me, but it was it was very cool. People were really nice there. People very generous. Um, I I reckon that's kind of where I get it because if if someone says they like something like oh I like your necklace oh you're going to aftershock that's cool oh this I said do you want it do you want my ticket do you want it I'll give it to you half the time I do <laughs> if if they accept it which is like around half the time so um and how you say that that's just kind of like a fun aspect of it but um the uh the last pride event that i had attended there was the biggest one we've ever had down there in my hometown um and i invited some of my friends who i knew were queer um over and like their parents wouldn't allow them to go like um or they had to it had to be very secret like we had to arrange that we pretended to be somewhere else um and like send pictures like oh i'm here when we weren't or get dropped off in certain areas so their parents like didn't think we were going to this pride event um so certainly for a lot of people it's it was just unacceptable in their families for them to be um interpreted as queer whether they were queer or not um and i i don't know um how if, if it has changed at all or how large the events are now for the uh, the Pride Center down in my hometown, but um, um, it, it was very cool and I, I learned a lot. Um, I remember we actually had um, in in that uh, Pride Center, there was a, um, a funeral for two um, lovely trans individuals um, from the county. Um, and one of their family members actually flew down from, I think it was Minnesota, to, you know, remember them. Um, so certainly there, there was violence against trans people in my hometown, um, as there are and as there is in most places, unfortunately. Um, um, but it's... So it sounds like there was community, but it was still really hard. There was community and there was generosity, but there was still a, a lack of attention and understanding of queerness, I would say. Were any of your classes in high school inclusive of queer and trans people's lives? No. <laughs> no. Not even for a minute? <laughs> That's no. hard to remember. <laughs> yeah. if I, sometimes I would make a, a joke like something something funny gay get it me gay funny <laughs> no i said that it per, per, verbatim i can't speak verbatim <laughs> um so one gay one like being gay or queerness yeah like it in the classroom was in this way is what you're saying i i would i would like just make a joke about my personal queerness like in um not in a like tokeny way it's, it's it was just kind of like uh, you know, a joke about it, um, and sh the teachers wouldn't really say anything, they would just be, kind of be like, okay, and then move on to whatever else, so it, it wasn't, like, super homophobic in the classrooms, um, it, it wasn't, you know, we hate you for, for most cases, it would be more like, okay, well, I, I am a teacher, um, anyways, <laughs> What about um, in college? Have you had any classes that are queer and trans inclusive? Yes. Yes. Um, I have had Rebecca Arnfeld as my um, art history teacher for one of the classes, and she is delightful. That was a very fun class. It was it was very inclusive in uh, a variety of intersectional ways. It was very cool. Um, and I'm also taking Professor Austin Schroep's uh, speech class currently. Um, and the whole class is queer centered, so it's very fun. Um, already in in you know a short amount of time, it, it's a lot more accepting and acknowledging of queerness than K through twelve, you know, all of high school. Uh, but yeah. so art history and then your communications class. Yeah. 
Have you had any other experiences with your classes actually talking about queer topics for people? Um, in some of my classes, we've discussed um, disability and stuff. Um, so accepting of that. But um, oh, that's good. Queerness, not really. And to be fair, around half of my classes have been online. So um, when when it's online. You know, you're mostly just going to be sticking to the material, so. Well, I guess that's part of the question. Is the material oh. inclusive? Like the reading, the lectures? The material. Um, not really. No. Unless it's a teacher who is an ally or it is quite literally a queer-centered class um, or the teacher themselves is queer, usually it queerness won't be acknowledged at all is what I notice um, so if you could would you take additional courses courses that focus entirely on queerness I think so I'm, I'm worried about scheduling but I I think it would be worth my time yeah so why do you think it's important for the curriculum to be inclusive of the queer and trans experience mm -hmm. It's important to recognize and learn about queerness because so much of the rest of the world, it, it doesn't acknowledge queerness, especially just other spaces where you're not actively, you know, trying to care, at least. Um, a lot of people just won't acknowledge it or just assume oh that's weird and then that's kind of it <laughs> um when really there's so much history i i just did a speech on bayard rustin um who uh assisted in the civil rights movement i'm sure you know this you're the teacher and whatnot um well people watching might not know <laughs> there you go <laughs> um but there's so much queer history and meaning and value in what it means to be queer. Um, a lot of, I, since I'm a little interested in Celtic paganism, one of the practices of um, that, you know, spiritual belief and just kind of tradition is that um, queer individuals, queer couples who adopt children were considered, the children of that were considered to be, like, extremely important because um, that would mean that um, if two people adopt a child, that child can kind of, you know, go off to uh, another area, um, like another part of the region of Ireland or, you know, part of the Isles. Um, and they would um they would just have like a major cultural exchange and be um you know if you have one guy on your team who's from the other team for kind of saying then you're gonna be nicer to the other team right so it's 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 just important to acknowledge that queer people exist and they have value yes i'm valuable i know that <laughs> so have you had the experience of your professors sharing their pronouns and asking students to share their pronouns um let's see most of my professors i mean at least online it like on canvas it'll say their pronouns um but uh in person not so much um on the on the first day some of my professors would if it was in person as well um but mm. do you think it's a helpful thing to do to ask students to share their pronouns and for professors to share their own pronouns i i, I think so um s sometimes i'm i'm not quite sure how to refer to someone and i'm not sure how they feel about their own gender because the way you dress isn't always the way you feel about yourself um like gender wise so um it's it's i i just want to respect people as much as i can you know i want to be a nice person it's good to be nice 
it's good to understand where people are coming from, who they are, um, before you try and get to know them or work with them more. So, yeah. So do you feel comfortable sharing your own pronouns in the classroom? Um, I mostly just say she, they. Um, uh, I, for example, there was a meeting with Phi Theta Kappa, um, and I, I was definitely the most oddball person there by a long shot. Um, I was wearing a Spider-Man shirt and I looked awesome. <laughs> um, but, uh, mm, <laughs> I, I was definitely, uh, a different person and I was the only person who used, um, how you say non-traditional pronouns, um, but I, I, I still said she, they rather than she, they, it, because I, I knew people would only discredit me more if they knew that I was extra different in their opinion. When you shared your pronouns with people in the classroom or in random clubs, um, do you have the experience of people actually using, when you share she and they, do you have the experience of people using they, or do they mainly stick to she? Most people just say she. I'm fine with that. I really have no issue. Yeah. Because you don't really have a preference. Yeah, nah. Yeah. And a lot of people do, and that is important to acknowledge yeah. that. If they do have a, a preference, then please do that um, most of the time, or, you know, at least a good portion of the time. But, um, me, I'm Barbara. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Me. I'm good. Um, what do you think, can you think of anything else that faculty can do in, in the classroom to make queer and trans students just feel more at home, more welcome? Hmm. Um, this is a pretty common one, but I reckon you could have like a little poster just, you know, in the room somewhere saying, something about inclusivity for queerness and inclusivity for other intersectional identities is a very good idea, I reckon. Um, Why do you think that would be helpful? Um, if you can visually tell that way from a teacher's room that indeed they do care, at least, you know, on the wall it says so, then you're going to feel a lot more comfortable being yourself and not trying to put up a facade that'll inevitably make you anxious and feel unwelcome and maybe not learn as well. So if you feel comfortable, it's just easier to pay attention to the material rather than, oh my god, am, am I, is something bad gonna happen like in one way or another, whether I get misgendered or, um, you know, what have you, if, if people are just gonna judge you. Um, it's it's easier to just pay attention if you don't have to worry about that. It's so much easier. I don't know if this is the case for you, but I think uh, at least at least one other student said this in an interview, and it got me thinking that if students feel comfortable coming out in the classroom, being their full selves, and being able to talk about being queer, uh, then they're more likely to find other students who are also queer in the classroom, and then they're more likely to do things like make a friend or form study groups and maybe that can help with um with doing well in the classroom when you feel like you have that sense of uh, when you're forming your relationships with people is that something that you've experienced or i mean yeah mm -hmm. what do you think about that i think that's very true um i i think that um if if you do have the ability in one way or another um if, if you can talk about it in class or even if you, you know, if you take the choice to have something on you with like a wristband or something that shows I'm queer, it's definitely easier to meet other queer people. Um, I've, I've had that in my experience. Um, I have a major caveat that I forgot to mention um, in, in high school. In classes, we would not discuss queerness, but we would have rare events like on the uh, school grounds where there would be a little stand where some people would hand out like those little flags you get at like Pride or whatever. Um, and that would happen maybe, it, there was only one or two of those. I, I think it was only one and it was in the last year of me being there before I had to move. 
and also it was after I moved <laughs> just a little bit. So there there was um, one major exception in my memory that um, queer, queerness was acknowledged in, in high school for that one in my hometown. Um, and in the high school that I, I, I had only been there for like a semester, the one, one of the ones up here, um, there was, there was a pretty vibrant GSA, but they were real transphobic, which is a whole thing. <laughs> so inevitably not a very safe space, which is, it's complicated if there's no trans representatives in a queer group. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Yeah. So we only have a few minutes left, and I definitely want to ask this question. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you think that the college could do to make trans and queer students feel more um, included on campus, more welcome? Feel more included. Mm -hmm. It's a very broad question, but mm -hmm. thinking like bathrooms, counseling, mm -hmm. events statements mm. sorry i'm leading you <laughs> um i'm i'm such a a non-picky person that i i just kind of vibe out and like am fine and a little complacent with whatever situation i'm in so even if it's not like you know the most accepting i'm i'm just still kind of like I've got a can-do attitude about it, so it's a little hard for me to see past it, but for, um, I might not have the best answer for this one compared to some other interviewees. Um, well, it's hard because it's usually the answer to this question is imagining something that doesn't exist, and it's not, right. does it normally exist? So then it can be hard to, um, come up with an answer because hmm. I'm thinking of possibilities there's events there's you could have talks on campus maybe you could have um, just more visibility for it um, uh, there are there are queer focused classes as well um, very few queer focused classes though. Yeah, very few. I think queer studies is the only really totally queer focused class being mm -hmm. offered right now. Mm -hmm. Which there could certainly be more. At other colleges and universities, there is, you know, a whole s section, a whole study, a whole in depth um, degree, I believe, you can get in queer studies. So. We have that one class here, but it's there's a lot more depth to it than what we have currently, I reckon. Um, so I think the, how important do you think the Pride Center is having a fully funded, fully staffed Pride Center? Is? Oh my gosh, the Pride Center has saved me so many times. Just the time, like recently that I had gone in saying, die of another neurodivergent autism moment <laughs> i think i have on i think i'm autistic ah. and then everybody there like understood it the the intersectionality and the ability to just go seek comfort with other queer people is so important to me um it's it's it can be hard interacting with people who if they see that I'm queer in one way or another, they, you know, judge or distance themselves from me. A lot of people see lesbians, like, as a threat, and I don't think I'm a threat. <laughs> it's, it's sometimes, oh, uh, I, I had been in a class with this one person, um, and there was a very inspirational uh, other lesbian who had been in that class with me. And when she was open about expressing um, feminism and her um, her lesbian identity, he would just start breathing louder. What? Why are you going to start breathing louder because she's gay? She's not a threat. Please. We're just gay. <laughs> Please. 
it's it it it's hard to be around people who don't ex accept it or get it in one way or another so it's just it's it's so important for me i i wouldn't be as happy as i am in my life right now if it weren't for um the pride c community that we have at school the pride center I wouldn't, I'd maybe not be doing as well in my classes if not for that, because it provides a sense of community, a, a sense of safety that, as I explained before, it's easier to focus on other aspects of your life if you're, if you have a sense of community, Maslow's hierarchy and all that. So a related question that I forgot to ask earlier, actually, we're in the last few minutes, but mm -hmm. where do you find queer joy? Queer joy! Ah! Queer joy. I really like music from queer artists. Um, Sophie, all caps, is a real good one. Charlie XCX. Um, uh, a lot of sorry, a lot of hyper pop music. It's very, it's very queer oriented. Um, very cool. Um, I, I just have a whole thing for music um, as well. But um, queer joy, queer joy. Um, I I ex I experience some queer joy when I really just get to be myself. When I get to experiment with gender, when I get to be around other people who are queer, who have stories about their their experiences, their love in you know queer relationships or situationships. Why not? Whatever they're doing, if they have stories, I want to hear them because they, they interest me and they make me happy. Um, they, it's, it's, it just, this is queer joy right now. Shoot. <laughs> Getting to talk about queer stuff is queer joy to me. Um, so if that counts for anything, I don't know. It's making me happy. Well, we have to wrap up in a minute, but is there anything else you want to add? Hmm. Um. Give this girl a raise. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh. How you say? Um. If if people take away anything from this. I hope they take away that there is a lot of intersectionality um, between race, gender, sexuality, um, neurodi neurodiversity, um, and don't expect people to be one thing and don't be surprised when they're more than one thing, I would say. Um, it, it makes people a lot safer feeling and a lot easier to put their focus towards the, their goals um, if they if they do feel comfortable um, in their present setting classroom or whatnot okay thank you yay